As we come to the preaching of the Word this morning, I'll ask you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139. Thank you. Appreciate it. No bottles, but just water. Should be just what I needed. Thank you. To Psalm 139. We'll be considering verses 13 to 18 specifically uh, this morning, but in order to build up the context for that, let me begin in verse 1. I'll read through verse 18. We'll ask the Lord's uh, illumination uh, on us as we study together. Psalm 139, this is the authoritative word of God. Let us, let us humble ourselves and receive it with faith and thanksgiving. For the choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your presence or where can I flee? Or where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in shale, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. And now the text of our passage this morning. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let's pray. Our God, we are not sufficient to even penetrate the depths of this psalm by our own strength. We pray that you would give us that ministry of your Spirit who opens up our eyes and softens our hearts to receive in faith the things that are written to illumine these things, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, we need the help of your Spirit now, so we pray that He would be to us that teacher who teaches us of you and who points us to your Son, Christ Jesus. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We've so far considered in Psalm 139 God's perfect knowledge of us in verses 1 to 6, and then last Sunday evening in verses 7 to 12, we considered God's presence uh, as we're moving through Psalm 139, that He knows us well and that He is in every place. The Lord fills heaven and earth. Indeed, where can we flee from His presence? If we ascend to heaven or if we make our bed in the grave, we never end up in a place where God is not. While all things that support us and encourage us in this life may give way, the thing that is our most profound source of encouragement, God himself, does not give way. The world can be turned upside down. You can be buried in the grave this afternoon, and you will not escape the presence of your God. If that's a presence that you dread and the presence from which you flee, these are terrifying words. But if that's the presence that is your delight and your consolation, these words are meant to console us. In our passage this morning... Uh, there's, a, there's a movement uh, toward God's perfect creation or what I'm calling God's perfect design of us that He's not only the knower and He's not only present, but He's the knower and He's present as the maker of all things and most particularly the maker of our lives. If we want to think of it in terms of divine attributes, though I don't want to press this too formally, we've started with a consideration of His omniscience. We've considered His omnipresence. Here today we consider not beside those things, but in addition to those things, his omnipotence, that he's not just the knower and the one present, but he's the one who knows and is present in all power as the maker and the sustainer of all things. In particular, we encounter his power in creation. There's something, though, about the way that he describes creation. There are many psalms 
uh, in which God's creation is described in the most grandiose and extensive terms. He's the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and all that is therein. That is to say, the comprehensive maker of, of all. John Calvin says, there is no Adam in the universe, but there we do not find bright sparks of his glory. But he is the one who fills all places with his power and presence and knowledge because he's the one who makes all things. Certainly that is the grand context behind the words of the psalmist in these verses, but the things that he brings out particularly are of God's personal and individual knitting of each human life. That those made in his image don't escape this creative power, that it's not just an indiscriminate throwing of a bit of paint against the wall and then seeing how it spreads or drips and then the individuals sort of individualize out of a mass of an undifferentiated creation, that in fact the differentiating, the making you be you and not me, and the making you be this way and not that way, the particularizing, the detail is also under his sovereign and creative activity. There is something about this, and maybe this by way of warning, uh, that is, by modern standards, invasive of personal space. I like personal space. I have an 18-inch rule. Some of you know close talkers. Some of you are close talkers. Um, I like at least 18 inches. Maybe even 24 is fine. If you're a close talker, that's fine. I'm not going to run away from the conversation. But I like, to, I like to have a little bit of my space. Several years ago, I was in the New Delhi airport, in which just socially space is a different thing uh, in India, and uh, our group of four passengers had arrived early, and there were plenty of seats in the seating area, and we took four seats, and as uh, departure got closer, the seats around us began to fill up, uh, and then finally, every seat in the waiting area was full, and a party that sat down next to us had one person too many for the available seats, which to me says that person will be standing or someone else will offer a seat. Uh, but in this case, the lone person standing found space on the same chair with a person in our party. Uh, wasn't asked, it wasn't, is there space here? There was one seat and the person just pushed into it. Um, at which point the Westerner, uh, understandably, decided to stand, um, to give space. That was too close for comfort. Can I say it like that? Too close for comfort. This text this morning, if you're fleeing from God and if his presence terrifies you, this will be too close for comfort. There is no distance, so to speak, between you and your maker. Religiously and morally, yes, you may be far from God in your heart, but as his handiwork, he is near to you in all of his creative power and skill. This is a creation that is close in every confidential and private detail. We find that God is intimately acquainted with us, not because He's investigated us, though certainly we see something like that in the first verses of this hymn or this psalm, but here He's near to us not so much as an observer, but as an actor, as a doer, as a maker. His presence here is that of the maker to the thing that he makes. I want to take just three points of consideration as we work through this section of the psalm together this morning by way of outline. First, that God designed you, verses 13 to 15, that God has designed you. Secondly, verse 16, that God determines your life. And this will flow out of the first consideration, that he does, he's the designer, but also the determiner of the life of the ones he designs. And then finally, that God deserves your adoration, we'll pick up the doxology in verses 17 uh, and 18 together. But first, let us consider verses 13 to 15, that God has designed you. This fact is established by a very colorful description of God as our Creator. What's immediately clear is that God is intimately acquainted with us. In fact, His work of creating each individual is described in a very delicate and tender manner. If you think of someone who builds out of, if you can think of maybe two ways of making a thing, someone who sculpts with clay, um, at, in the final touches there may be some skill, but when you, when you sculpt with clay, uh, you're just initially at least just slapping clumps of clay on and giving it a basic outline before you come in uh, with the detail. But if you could contrast that to, say, needlepoint, in which you don't just 
throw yarn or to throw thread together, you skillfully draw and close, place and draw the thread. There's a kind of delicacy in it, a, a carefulness in that way of making. That's how he's described here. It's not that God just simply hurls a bunch of material out there and takes a sledgehammer and kind of beats it roughly into, you know, circular shape or something like this, but that here he's described as the one who is knitting us, and this is the language that he uses. He uses the language of knitting. Is God a knitter? Yes. Not of sweaters or scarves, but of men and women. That he's a maker and that he makes with the delicacy of needle points, so to speak. Conjures up different thoughts than our usual way of thinking about creation by fiat. We think of God saying, let it be, and it was. This is fiat. This is God making by a decree of his power, executing his purpose. And yet the fiat is not, in this case, general, but particular. He doesn't say, let there be light or let there be planets. He says, let there be James, let there be Sean, let there be Donna, and then he does all that is necessary to the knitting of that individual created in his image. The reason David speaks this way is so that we can understand that no one knows us better than God himself. You can think of an artist who shows her artwork or her needlepoint, and she knows that work better than you do. You know the final product, but she understands the final product better than you do because she understands every single decision that went into producing the final product. If I may reference favorably a pagan of old, Aristotle said that a thing is known best when it's known in its causes. The person who understands this room better than you and I is the one who understands everything that goes into the making and the sustaining of this room. I think there's something fundamentally correct about that. He doesn't just know you as a product. He knows you as the product of his creative activity. And what he knows when he knows you is he doesn't just know you. He knows you because he knows himself making you. He knows you in your most fundamental principles and causes. God knows you best. The human is, in fact, quite a complex thing, both materially and immaterially, a composite of body and soul. Undoubtedly, God is God's most complex and exquisite creation. Angels are wonderful creatures, but there's no material part, properly speaking. Lower animals are, and, and plants and minerals are wonderful creatures, but there's no reasonable soul. With the angels, we share intellect. With the animals, we share bodily appetites and functions. With the plants, we share the capacity to grow by nutrition. We have something in common with the creatures below us, and we have something in common with the creatures above us, and we are ourselves a wonderful complex of low and high parts knit together into a perfect unity that is man, that is human. There are still innumerable things about the human body that even medical science has not discovered. Both pleasant and painful, there are certain pathologies that destroy us that are still elusive. There are certain diseases that we can diagnose, but we don't understand the pathology well enough to know how to cure it yet. But there are also functions of our body, bodies that keep us alive, that sustain us, that are actually benefiting you right this minute, of which medical science is also not fully comprehending. That we are, even in our material selves, a complex. In fact, in as much as we're each concerned about our physical well-being, uh, we are happy to have our government give money to research for medical science so that we can preserve and benefit human life, that we consider life to be a good thing worth preserving and that we're willing to invest a lot of time uh, and resources into it. Part of the reason for the investment is because there's just so much we do not know that we seek to know, but God knows. God knows. He's the one who placed every part in, its just, in just such an arrangement to function and benefit us in just such a way 
the things that are going on in your body right now that are sustaining your very life at this second would be absolutely bewildering if you could enumerate them one by one. And if we had an exam on Friday, I, I'm not sure if it were comprehensive. I mean, when, I, when you take anatomy, physiology, we just deal with the big stuff. How many bones are in the human body? More at birth than later on because the little, the little sections of your skull are actually distinct bones and then they fuse together and so an adult has fewer distinct bones than a baby. And you know, you learn these sorts of, you learn these sorts of things and then you have to name them and you, learn, you memorize the medial and distal parts and hopefully the exam is medial parts today and distal parts next week so you don't have to hold it all together at once. And we're still just kind of in the big stuff. We're not even down in the bone marrow yet. What a complex... What a, we'll see the psalmist respond in this way in a second. What a, what a wonderful thing. And yet, that's not all there is to man. And in fact, as wonderful as that is, that's not even his most noble part. He is also a creature who reasons, who is endowed with intellect, who indeed has a soul, a soul that does survive the very death of his body, a soul that when his body goes to the grave, it does not because it's not like that. It's not that kind of thing. When God builds men and women, when he builds boys and girls, he builds them as a complex of material and immaterial parts, a body and a soul and all the complexity of that. Consider first, verse 13, uh, that he's created your inner man. I want to focus on this part particularly, and then we'll consider the the lower part, the bodily part in a second. For you formed my inward parts, literally, you formed my kidneys, which, you know, if I were picking inner parts, and if it were just about internal organs, I, I think I'd go brain or heart first. But he says kidneys. It's an interesting way of saying it. I think what he's after here is not so much the organ of the kidney as much as the kidney stood metaphorically for the inner man. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul makes a distinction between the inner man and the outer man. And he says that the outer man is wasting away day by day, but the inner man is being renewed according to the image of the one who made him. The inner man is being built up. There's a certain sense in which your inner man, you know, if if, if this were a thing, your inner man gets younger by the day, so to speak. Your inner man is being renewed. Your inner man is mounting up with wings as eagles. Your inner man is receiving strength. And as as strength flows out of your outer man, as you grow in grace and you grow in Christ and you grow in communion with God, your inner man grows stronger. As far as the Christian faith is concerned, the strongest should be those who are in Christ the longest. Even if they need a walker or a wheelchair, that's the outer man. I don't say the outer man doesn't matter. The outer man matters greatly. It matters greatly to me personally, but it matters to God as well because it's part of that wonderful design, and he designs to save the outer man as well as the inner man. It's just that there's a delay. There's a delay. The outer man will be saved in the day of resurrection when it is joined again to the inner man, but the inner man now is being renewed day by day. He says, you have formed my inward parts. The question then is, is he talking about the internal organs as opposed to the external ones? Um, you know, as we say when we're kids, my guts <laughs> as opposed to my you know, fingers and hair and the stuff that you can see? Are we just talking about the visible and the invisible? Or does he mean something a, a little more than that? And I, I submit to you that what he's after when he says the inner man is that he's talking about the heart or the soul, the, reason, the, the seat of reasoning and of emotion and of intention and of purpose. Listen to two, uh, different use, two different psalms that use the same word that is translated here, my inward parts, which is the word kidneys, but listen to two other texts that use this term. Psalm 7, verse 9. O oh, let the evil of the wicked one come to an end, of the wicked come to an end, but establish the kingdom, for the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. The word that there is translated minds is our same word here for inward parts or kidneys, that the Lord tries the hearts and the kidneys. But you understand that the word heart there is not referring to the organ that pumps blood in your chest, and the kidneys is arguably not referring to that wonderful filtration system uh, that kind of separates and makes sure that you don't succumb to some toxicity, um, that the kidneys and the heart refer to, refer to the, the, the seat of man's thinking and desires 
and intentionality. I submit that that he's, he's getting at that here as well, that he makes your soul a reasonable soul. Second psalm I want to consider, Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and try me. Oh, by the way, just I can't resist this. I interrupt the psalm for a second because our psalm says, search, verse 23 of our psalm says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. So I want to argue that there is a parallel already in, in Psalm 26. In Psalm 26, when he says, Examine me, O Lord, and try me, I guess what I wanted to say is the thought context of Psalm 26 and of Psalm 139 is the same. Listen to how we translate it here. Try me, test my mind. That's how it's translated in the New American Standard, not inward parts, but same word, kidneys. Test my kidneys and my heart. Test my kidneys and my heart. What's he getting after here? If I can put it in more common language, the God God knows our inner man, not just your guts and your physiological organs and their interrelation and the well-being and their placement and position, but he also knows that deeper reality, what you think, how you think, why you think, what makes you think, and then in addition to that, what makes you intend, that is to say, knowledge, but also will, intentionality, purpose, desire, appetite, emotion, the seat of these things, which is arguably not reducible to a brain state, in other words, Being in love is not simply neural firing in sector 776 of your brain. That's what a materialist thinks. A materialist thinks there's no such thing as love. Um, There's no such thing as joy. There are just things we call love and joy, which are just little neural firings in our brain. Materialism reduces man to nothing but the sum of his material bits. That's not what the psalmist is doing here. He's not reducing your inner man to kidneys. Kidneys is being used as a metaphor for that, that heart and soul, as we might say, that center that makes man tick. He might think about this. That's the part that's hardest to see, in fact. It's easier, especially if you have a cadaver, I suppose, it's easier to sort of bisect a man, open him up, and examine all those hitherto hidden things. And if he's still alive, that's not an option. And so you can use 3D ultrasound or some other kind of x-ray technology to see inside. Or if you can't see, unless you cut him open, you arrange it in such a way that he can survive the procedure. That's the goal anyway. But I don't think that's what he's after here. When you get there, you're not going to find these inward parts because these inward parts aren't the kind of inward parts that a doctor or a physician can see. These aren't the kind of inward parts that are what we call the remains of a man. This is, in fact, what doesn't remain in the body upon death. The heart, desires, purpose, intentionality, what you are about, if I can put it that way. God creates you to be that kind of person, a person who knows, a person who is able to judge and see what is good, a person who can know and perceive moral obligation to seek the good, a person who's able to not just exist, but also to exist in a way that understands that God is the one who feeds us, who sends us rains and fruitful harvests and gives us wine to gladden the heart, someone who can actually assess his, uh, his or her own existence and realize that the only proper response to this is gratitude. God makes you to be that kind of person let's say, religious, religious in nature, to be a worshiper as you, with knowledge of the truth, respond to the one who provides all things for you. When God builds men and women, he builds them with a soul, a reasonable soul, and with a will. This may be for us, even to ourselves, perhaps one of the darker parts of our being. I don't mean dark in the sense of morally, though perhaps morally dark. Um, It's certainly the seat of sin in each one of us. But just in the sense of understanding, understanding the soul is arguably more difficult than understanding the body. The body can be observed by ready empirical evidence, but the soul, the thoughts, the intentions of the heart. I can go to a doctor and I can't, if if I have cancer or some other disease, I may not be able to hide that from the doctor, but if I have sin in my heart, I can hide that very well. That's the deeper, that's the deeper part of me. 
Listen to the words just before our section, verse 12, which we considered last Sunday night. He says, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the, light, and the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike to you. I submit that that isn't just a statement about God knowing your circumstances. I submit that that's also God knowing your heart. Your heart may be, you may be alienated from your own heart. You may be an enigma to yourself and to those around you, but you're not an enigma to God. He's the one who formed your inward parts. He then adds, in addition to this, uh, your outer man, by outer man here, I mean the inside and outside parts of your material self, and he says this, you wove me in my mother's womb. Now, here, I think here he has is, he is introduced inner and outer man, my inward parts, my material parts, and then before he'll come back to this, but before he does, he interjects here with a word of praise, I will give thanks to you. I am not my own. I don't belong to myself. I am the handiwork of someone else. Some other artist and maker possesses me as his product. I am not my own, so I will give thanks. I am not self-sufficient for my own life. My life is a gift. My existence is a gift. My body is a gift. My soul is a gift. I will give thanks. You wove me in my mother's womb. God skillfully makes not just the, outer man, the inner man, but also the outer man, that he puts us together and he knits us joint and marrow, bones and flesh, and builds us from the very instant of conception right through to the, the, the readiness for, to be delivered in birth, that nine month from gestation to delivery, the Lord is the one who is at work in every stage. This is his handiwork. This is... This is his delicate and wonderful production in the womb of the mother. E.J. Young says, It is one thing to speak of creation in general. It is something else to realize that God is our personal creator. To call God the creator is certainly true. But we should not omit to call God my creator. And when you say my creator, that just changes. If I say the creator of you know, the Mona Lisa, I'm referring to Da Vinci. But what have, what have I to do with Da Vinci besides just appreciating his artwork? But if I say the creator of all things and my creator, <laughs> then, suddenly, then suddenly that changes the relationship entirely. It's not just describing what God did out there. It's describing what God has done and is doing here. And it places obligation immediately upon me. The response then... He says this, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. Now he kind of broadens it out. Wonderful are your works. He kind of goes, he says, he looks at himself and then he looks at all the rest of God's handiwork and he says, this is wonderful and that is wonderful. I mean, you, I know we often emphasize that we do exist in a fallen world. We exist in a world that is under the curse. We exist in a world with deficiencies and abnormalities. Romans 8 says that the created, the created order is currently groaning under the curse that was placed upon it because when mankind fell, the created order over which he had been placed also was subjected to a curse in consequence of his sin. True. All of that is true. The evidence is around us. And yet... This is not to contradict, but I want to add. And yet, how many are your works, O Lord, and wisdom you have made them all? Psalm 104, 24. And yet, babies are conceived in mother's wombs and delicately and carefully knit every day, even at this very moment. So that for all the curse and the defilement and the death and the degradation, there still remains abundant evidence to his wonderful works. And he doesn't say, well, it would have been wonderful without the curse. It would have been more wonderful. And yet the psalmist says, how wonderful are your works? My soul knows it very well. He doesn't mean pre-fall. He means everywhere God's works are, even after the fall, there's evidence of wonder and there's ground for worship as we consider his handiwork. David interrupts then his contemplation of himself in embryonic form. He introduces it. He praises. He returns to it. E.J. Young says, to be pitied is the man who can discourse about the greatness of God without emotion, who knows God. Uh, he who knows God and loves him cannot speak of him without feeling. And you really get that, I think, in verse 14. 
I will give thanks for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, but then he doesn't move. He's not just giving a report. Oh, and by the way, I should give thanks, you know, kind of a monotone. Wonderful are your works. It's, it's uh, exclamatory. If, you know, if you're back in grade school, what kind of sentence is this? It's not, it's, it's not an interrogative. Um, it's not a hortatory, which is a command. Um, it's an exclamatory, and you might put an exclamation point after that, at least in our... How wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. He's contemplating himself as God's handiwork, and he's contemplating all of the things as God's handiwork as the very author of life. And David says, in fact, not just that he kind of, rec- kind of recognizes it. Look at what he says. My soul knows it very well. This is, this is, there's a challenge here for us. Do we contemplate God as the creator of all and the creator of ourselves individually? And do we contemplate it that we could say with the psalmist, my soul knows it very well? That is to say that I have a kind of passing sense that there might be something big out there that might have been the reason for stuff kind of generally. You know what I mean? Do you find people who say this? And it seems like their souls do not know their creator very well, but they know their creator obliquely and kind of in a shadowy way and a way in which they quickly move on after kind of giving a nod in God's direction. He says, my soul knows it very well. This is a man who is imbued with the contemplation of God his maker, God, the one who designs him and executes that design with perfect specificity. Verse 15, he fills it out for us. My frame was not hidden from you, literally my bones. <laughs> my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. We must remember he's saying this before the days of ultrasound and 3D ultrasound. Um, I submit to you, though, having, having seen uh, ultrasound over 10 years, it was better by the time Eden was conceived than when my first, when our oldest was conceived. The, the technology had advanced so rapidly in those 10 years between our first and third child. When we went in to see our third child in ultrasound, we didn't know if it would be a boy or girl that was kept from us, but what we could see was breathtaking. Seeing it didn't make it less wonderful. He's saying, when I was made in secret. Let me submit to you that he's not just simply saying, well, it was secret and invisible, but now that we can see it, it's kind of all the mystery's gone out of it. The mystery of human life in a mother's womb is no less wonderful when you can peek inside than when you can't. He says, when I was made in secret, and then listen to what he says, and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth, which is an interesting metaphor. The depths of the earth here is is a metaphorical reference to the womb of his mother, sort of deep down hidden from the land of the living inside of mother's womb. I was, again, he says, skillfully wrought, skillfully wrought, that of all God's creation, there there is an exquisite detail in which man is made in his image and bears his likeness, and for that reason is exalted above all the visible created order, it being placed under his rule and his dominion. That's a, what, a, what a wonderful thing. He says, God didn't get to know me. God never didn't know me. I get to know God, but God doesn't get to know you. God's the reason for you. There's no you without God skillfully knitting and making you. My, uh, your eyes, I'll pause after this, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. What he means is, You've seen me in process, <laughs> not yet completed and ready to leave my mother's womb, and you have watched me over every step of that way. He contemplates richly and knows very well God's design for him. Our second point to consider, more briefly but not less importantly, that God determines your life, that God determines your life. Verse 16, uh, the, the second line to the, to the fourth line. It's not... It's not, that, it's not simply, if I could put it in these terms, I mean, it's not just that God has knowledge of you prenatally, before your birth, but God also has perfect knowledge and watch and care over you postnatally. That is to say, after your birth. Not just in your mother's womb, and then as soon as you come out of your mother's womb and the umbilical cord is cut, you're cut free from God. You may be cut free from mother, but you aren't cut free from maker. Can we, can we say that? That when, you, when we are born, there's a certain sense in which we gain a physiological independency from our mothers. I cut the cord three times on three children. <laughs> that's, the, that's all I did, just so we're clear. My wife assures me, big deal. <laughs> big deal. Well, you know, it was a big deal to me. It was all I had to do. What, what else was I going to do? 
Um, I like to say I, I provided a soft arm to dig fingernails into, and then I cut the cord. And that's, I'm not sure I added anything else to that event. Here's the thing, though. When you are cut free from dependency upon mother, oh, by the way, not really, <laughs> because you're still very dependent upon mother, but when you gain an independency from your mother, you do not correspondingly gain an independency from your God. The God who formed you, who knit you, who skillfully made you, does not simply do that for nine months and then take his leave of you at birth. Prenatal care, postnatal care. That's what he's after here. He says, in your book, verse 16, in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now, how does he, how does he connect this uh, to, the, to the statement that went before? It's interesting He's speaking about, again, God's perfect knowledge, but I want us to just to observe what kind of knowledge this is. This is not the knowledge of a mere observer, someone who looks in, as it were, from the outside and takes notes and chronicles the life or the events of a people or of a person or a nation. He says, in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. Um, it doesn't come out as easily in the English, but in the Hebrew, Verse 13, when he says, you formed my kidneys, or my inward parts, the word here that is translated ordained in the, in the New American Standard, which I think is a good translation, I think that really gets at the sense of it, but it is in fact the same word, that you formed my life in my mother's womb, but that is not, that is not the beginning and the end of God's formation work. You formed me in my mother's womb, but you also formed everything else. The days that were, you could translate it, though it seems strange to our ears, in your book were all written the days that were formed for me. How does God, why does God know your life? Why does God know your life? It's not because God is just simply a cosmic observer of things. It's not simply that He sees. He sees and knows in a distinctive way. He sees and knows because He makes the actuality, body, soul, life, breath, all things that in the sum total are you, He knows because He makes. That's not how I know you. That's not how you know me. You're not my maker. You're not my sustainer. You're my friend, my family, my brother or sister in Christ. You know me from the outside. You know me as an observer can know. And if you get to know me more, not saying that would be a big prize for you, but if you got to know me more uh, than you do, it would be by way of discovery. You wouldn't, back to the statement, a thing is known best when it's known in its causes. You don't know me in my causes. You may know my, if you know God though, and if you know God as my maker, and I don't know God as my maker, then you know me better than I know myself. That's true. That's true. Because you know my maker and you know in whose image I am made, there may be a sense in which I may be a stranger to myself and I'm less of a stranger to you than I am to myself. That's possible. I don't want to get lost in the sort of rabbit hole of that consideration, though it is a, quite a profound one. I want to say this, though. That just isn't the way God knows us. God, God, isn't, God isn't, as it were, knocking on the door of your heart, really hoping to get to know you, but until you allow it, it's, he just can't get inside. There is no inside where God isn't already fully present in formative power. You are no mystery to God. You may be a mis mystery to each other. You may be a mystery to yourself, but you are no, you may be a mystery to the angels, but you are no mystery to God. Because the days, when he says, for a, couple, a couple things we should observe about this. The book is a book about you in one respect. You see this second line? In, in your book were written all the days that were formed for me. Your life is written in a book. <laughs> but it's not an autobiography. You aren't the author and the book isn't yours. You aren't the author and the book isn't yours. He says, in your book, not my book. You know, sometimes you have a guest book at your church or your home. People come over, hey, can you sign my guest book? Um, and then you write the date and then the day that was 
planned for you to come to my house is now recorded in my book. But who wrote in my book? You wrote in my book. Now, if it were my daily planner, I'd be writing in my book about your visit. But if it were my guest book, you might write your visit in my book. We don't write our lives into God's book. He writes our lives into his book. He doesn't just author our lives, soul and body, he also, he also authors our lives in terms of going, coming, sitting, lying down, the things that he discusses earlier in the psalm. He writes the book of our lives so that each step and each direction falls within his perfect plan for us. Even, we need to be clear, even those stretches that lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. His hand leads us, and no problem. The darkness is not dark to him. The darkness is as light as day to him. It's dark for you, but it's not dark for him. Sometimes he leads us on a very straight path, and sometimes he sets us on a crooked path. I don't mean morally, but I mean just in terms of unforeseen circumstances of our lives in which we aren't as certain about our future as we are at other times, and he ordains that course for us. He ordains that path for us. He ordains weal. He ordains woe. He ordains sickness. He ordains health. He ordains the storms of life. He ordains the tranquility of life. He ordains it to fall out for us in just such a certain pattern for a certain duration according to His purposes for us in His book written about us. This is David's... This distresses people. Have you, have you found that? The, the idea that I am not the primary author of my own life, that I am not ultimately the one determining, you know, the captain of my own fate, the master of my own soul, that everything ultimately, the buck ultimately stops with you. You don't even give yourself your next breath. All things are from him, through him and to him. He gives to all life breath and all things. And we delude ourselves with authorship. This doesn't mean that we don't have will and that we don't have purpose. There, there's a time and a place to discuss that, and it's significant theologically. Uh, and yet here the psalmist doesn't seem particularly vexed by all of this. Do you, do you get that? He says, in your book were written the days that were ordained for me. He doesn't say, that's no fair. I should be authoring the book. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what man trying to, as it were, cut the umbilical cord from God tries to do. I'll, be, I'll do it myself, thanks. My son is 17 years old now. He wants freedom. It's natural to want freedom. And there's a sense in which I should, I should be giving him that freedom, and I should let him make of it what he will, to stumble or to not. I need to be a parent. I need to guide him. But less and less am I able to do that, not because he's a bad kid, but because he's a human, and he doesn't ultimately depend upon me, and he depends less and less upon me. That's, a, that's natural. It's natural to want to go out there and make it on your own, but it's wicked when we bring that mindset to our Creator. God, let me go. Let me be. I can do this on my own. There's a, that's true human to human, but that's not true creator to creature. Independence from God is annihilation. It's delusional. If in Him we live, move, and have our being, if you were untethered from Him, you would not be. We need to, get, we need to be filled with a sense of radical dependency. James 4.15 reminds us, that we shouldn't say, tomorrow I will go to such and such a city and buy and sell, but say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. I love that he doesn't just say, if the Lord wills, I will do this or that. He prefaces it, if the Lord wills, I will live and do this or that. I mean, here's the thing about that, I've noticed, that if you aren't living, you don't do things, right? I mean, there's a certain kind of, there's a, you can live and not do, but you can't do and not live. So he says, both are from the Lord. If the Lord wills, I will live and do. Or maybe you'll live and not do if the Lord wills, or maybe you won't live if the Lord wills. And in fact, the psalmist is alert to that as well. Back to our verse 16, he says, in your book were written the days that were formed for me, and then he says, when as yet there was not one of them. God has appointed your first day. God has appointed your last day. He's appointed every breath and every bit of sustenance to get you from day one to the finality of days that he's ordained for you. And that God is the one who is making this perfect provision so that if the Lord wills, I will live and do things so long as by his leave he gives me life and gives me breath. The question for my heart, the question for your heart, is whether you have resigned yourself to that authority 
to that wisdom, to that watch, and to that care. And I think day by day we struggle with this. When life is difficult, it is tempting, if not in so many words, at least in the disposition of our hearts, to grumble against the Lord, our Maker. Israel grumbled in the wilderness about the Lord's provision, and it looked so petulant and, rep and repulsive. And yet, we can be tempted to do that. The psalmist here is contemplating God's provision. He's settling his heart into a praise and a wonder. Why does God know us? Not because he simply observes, but because his knowledge is not just, his knowledge is not informed. His knowledge informs things. Things don't inform his knowledge. Who is his counselor has informed him or taught him in the way of knowledge? Isaiah 40. God, is, God learns nothing. God isn't taught. He's not educated. Educated means to educe form where there isn't form. He's not educated. He's not informed because he never is outside of the state of knowing all things. God doesn't learn, not because he's ignorant, but because all things are because he intends and knows them. His knowledge gives form to things. For us, our knowledge is informed by things. His knowledge is a different sort of knowledge than ours. And David, David finds himself at peace and at rest contemplating this. He makes no attempt here to reconcile uh, you know, this high language of determination and formation, predestination with human responsibility and freedom. Certainly David, I mean, the David who wrote Psalm 51 certainly feels a sense of personal moral obligation and guilt that he doesn't shove off on God. David of Psalm 51 doesn't say, well, the days that were ordained for me before there was yet one of them are God's, are God's writing, and he wrote it in his book. And so, so much for Uriah and Bathsheba, I'm off the hook. David doesn't exhibit some sense of of moral innocence when he sins, but at the same time, he doesn't, as it were, preserve his moral culpability by downgrading his God's sovereignty. He is simply at peace with both realities. At peace with both realities. In fact, rather than being vexed by all this, David seems, and this I submit to you is the response of faithfulness to these words, David seems peculiarly comforted by all of it. To know that there's not one thing I can do you can, you know, you can be responsible as they say, you know, eat your veggies, go have your, I told you last week I had my annual physical, not my favorite thing, but I'm at that age where it needs to be annual. And, uh, you know, they want to know my family history so they can start looking for the signs of, of anything wrong in me. Um, there are certainly means and responsibilities, but in the end, we do not add to the book in which the days were formed. Maybe eating your vegetables, so to speak, and having that surgery are the means that God ordained to bring you to the day that he ordained to be your final day. So we don't neglect the use of means, but we realize that we cannot add but one moment to our lives by our own doing and by our own ingenuity. David, David finds contentment to this. He leaves to his Lord to order and provide. That this sovereignty does not crowd him out and suffocate him but the sovereignty is actually the source of his consolation and of his peace. That these, do, that these days were ordained for me by a God who is much wiser and who cares more about me and knows more about me than I could possibly hope to myself. That's the test of faith, that will he tr entrust himself to this God. Certainly he does. And in our final consideration, um, our final point, verses 17 and 18, that God deserves your adoration. For all this, what should be your response? My response, thanksgiving, thanksgiving. Think of the challenge in Romans 1, 20 and 21, uh, well, maybe 19 through 21, where it says that God did not leave himself without witness, that he, in fact, has made himself known among all people. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, he says, have been clearly seen through the things that are made so that they are without excuse in other words, that you have a God who provides all things and is the reason for all things and to whom you owe all is something that is made evident even in the natural order. And yet he says of wicked men, though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. And then he adds, or give thanks. Or give thanks. He says, verse 14, I will give thanks to you. Verse 17, he picks up the doxology begun in verse 14 by giving thanks. So there's a sense in which 
God's my creator, inner man, outer man. He gives thanks. Goes back to a contemplation of his outer man, then contemplates his life outside of the womb until the end of it. And then in verse 17, comes right back to the doxology again. Verse 17 is a kind of continuation of what was begun in verse 14. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Hans Krauss says, For humans, the appropriate expressions, indeed the only meaningful expressions in the presence of God, are thanksgiving and astonishment. Not, thanks. Thanks. I mean, that's fine. Like if someone holds the door for you, you know, it seems like a small thing, but they've given you a way through that was needed, so you say thanks because they gave you something you needed, access. Thanks. But when it's life and breath and all things, inner and outer man, skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth and sustained by the hand of God, thanks won't cut it. Uh, Thanks plus adoration. Thanks plus wonder. That doesn't have to, you know, each of us probably has a very different temperament. Um, Some are very mellow and unexcitable and, you know, maybe you're Scandinavian and some have more um, Italian uh, in their background, it's just going to, you know, or, or Latin, and it's just going to look a little different in terms of expression. But the disposition of the heart should be wonder. The disposition of the heart should be awe. The entire psalm is not a cold calculation of attributes. I don't mind a little cold calculation sometimes, systematic theology, looking through the evidence, and, you know, dispa- but this is not dispassionate. This isn't academics. This is worship. This is love. This is adoration. This is sacred, his response. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. He doesn't just say, yeah, God knows all things. How beautiful, how wonderful. He, precious. Something's precious when you hold it close. What's precious to him is the knowledge God has of him. That God knows him not just as an observer but as creator. He says, this is precious to me. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God? The, what is man? This is what is Psalm 8. What is man, verse 4, that you take thought of him? What, is, what are you that the maker of all would fashion you and ordain your days and write your life in a book? What is man that you should take thought of him And then he says, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God, that he should give to you life, breath, and all things. He doesn't just hurl some breath out there and say, anyone want some breath? It's over here. Got to move on. He causes you, you, singular, to draw breath. And he gives you that breath that you can breathe it in praise to him, that you can sing it to him, and that you can tell it to others. We read earlier in Psalm 40 that he tells God's glory in the assembly. When we sing, we're using the breath to both praise him and also to encourage each other in our faith. He gives, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. And then he says the next line, how vast is the sum of them. Indeed, how vast, how many. God's thoughts to you are as vast as all the distinct peculiarities of your life, material and immaterial. How vast. Every breath, every physiological mechanism that goes into the drawing of every breath, every every neural firing in your brain that actually orders the physiology of your body, sending codes through your lower cerebral cortex and then down your spine, causing you to be able to take one step or to lift one arm, how vast the sum of his thoughts toward you. But he doesn't stop there because it's not just your outer man and physiology, it's also your soul, how vast and how precious your thoughts to me. Verse 18, if I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. Then here's the question. Rather, but, but he doesn't get lost in this. He doesn't get lost in this. He contemplates this, but he doesn't get lost in it. He says, when I awake, I am with you. What does he draw from all this? That I'm in his hands, not my own hands. That when I awake, I am with you. Jeremiah 29, 11, the Lord says to the Israelites, pointing to their future restoration, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. David, 
can have that assurance because he belongs to his God. If you belong to God, not if you're sinless, but if you've cast yourself on him, if you've prostrated yourself in worship before him, if you haven't withheld thanksgiving from him, and if you have sought the reconciliation that he provides through his son, who is the way, the truth, and the life, the one through whom no one comes to the Father, if you've come to the Father through the one given, how precious his thoughts toward you. How vast the sum, not just to provide for your outer man, but to provide for your spiritual well-being, to provide for your soul, a soul that was hostile and unbelieving and ungrateful, that, has been, that was stony, that has been made flesh, that has been brought near to him, that has been given joy in place of harshness, that has been given light in place of darkness. How precious and vast your thoughts toward me. Consider his thoughts this way finally then. Most particularly, we're told that we are to have this mind in ourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, that though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or a, grasp, a matter of grasping, but made himself of no account, taking to himself the form of a servant. How, he says, that this is the mind of Christ Jesus. He doesn't, this is the mind of our God. He doesn't look out only for his interests, but also for the interests of others. God knows all, but God looks out for what He has made and sustains what He has made. And when it comes to the sustaining of our souls, He has made provision and offered that provision to us in the person and work of Christ Jesus. He offered a sacrifice to take your sins away, sins you can't count, sins you can't even enumerate. He says later on, um, try my heart, know me, even the secret sins. He has provided a substitute who carries those sins in His body on the tree. God doesn't leave sin unpunished. That would be to abdicate his own justice. But he places the sins of sinners on the back of his son. He carries them to the cross. How precious his thoughts toward you. How precious indeed. Paul calls this in 2 Corinthians, God's indescribable gift. Indescribable. Words fail. A gift that would come and take away your sin and your offense. A gift who would lay himself down unto death, and yet conquer the grave in resurrection and reward. A gift who would take away your sin and open up the way of life for you. Verse 18, David says, when I awake, when I awake, I am still with you. Perhaps there are a couple ways to take this that are valid. Certainly every day, when you, you know, you, there are reasons why we have these children's prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. It goes on past that, but I forget it. You take my meaning, though, and when you wake in the morning and your soul is still held by Him and with Him, your first response when your eyes open should be thanksgiving, that there's a sense in which when I lay myself down to sleep, I'm in that very vulnerable. Sleep is, I love sleep, but it's vulnerable. Things can go on when you're sleeping. <laughs> you're not aware. You're not able to even give yourself, if you're, if you're in a very deep sleep, all sorts of mischief can go on around you and could happen to you. I mean, you are not more vulnerable, it seems, than when you sleep. And he says, but when I awake, I'm still with you. And here's the thing, whether he awakes back into this life or whether he awakes into the life to come, right? Whether I ascend to heaven or make my bed in shale, whether I awake on the other side of the portal of death, I am with you. Listen, that is true if you have sought refuge in Christ Jesus. If you have trusted the death and resurrection of Jesus to save your sins and have in faith embraced him as your own savior, then when you awake, whether it's on the other side of the grave or it's back in your bedroom where you went to sleep the night before or on the plane where you fell asleep and woke up later, behold, when I awake, I am with you. I think ultimately, ultimately, the horizon here is resurrection. That if you've trusted God for this life and the next and you've taken refuge in His Son, Jesus Christ, this death is but a portal unto a life more abundant, unto a life more rich and delightful than even this one, which is already filled with so many good things. But ultimately, not just your soul. Everything that God made, inner man, outer man, will through Christ and through Him alone be given to participate in that awakening unto newness of life with God in which there will never be separation, from which we will never drift away. These words are written to encourage us. These words are written to, to bolster our faith, 
to give us a love for our God, to even cause us more to, in our hearts, cast ourselves on Him for life, breath, all things, and especially for the needs of our souls alienated by sin, that He makes provision for that thing as well through His Son, Christ Jesus. Let's give Him thanks now together. Our Heavenly Father, we, we come before You and we're